And I have the pleasure to invite Stefania Giannini, member of the Italian Parliament, here to the stage as the member states play a very critical role in the EU still as well. Hi. Hi. Welcome. The floor is Good yours. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, let me thank the organizer of this high-level conference on the future of war for inviting me. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, as former minister of education, uh, university and research in my country, that's what I was until uh, December 2016, to be here as a moderator of this exciting uh, panel, uh, whose panelists are three current ministers uh, of three uh, different European countries. Uh, I want to, I, I, I'm sure that they will give a great contribution uh, to our discussion uh, today. It was already heard very, very important and innovative uh, contents. Well, uh, let me introduce in a few words uh, uh, each of them and uh, also invite uh, each of them to come and to join me here on stage. Ladies first, sorry, Minister Onisovsky, uh, starting from north to south. Um, we have uh, Minister Ilva Johansson. Uh, she's the Swedish Minister of Employment and uh, Integration. She has a long-term uh, impressive career in uh, both as a uh, politician, as a member of the Swe Swedish uh, government. Uh, she was Minister of Education and Health to do very hard jobs, Hilda, I think. I know something about the first one. And uh, also as a member of the uh, parliament for over uh, 10 years. Uh, she has another very interesting aspect. Uh, there is another very interesting aspect in her personality. I want to mention it. Uh, she is a very passionate uh, woman not only for politics and social affairs, social engagement, but also for sport and football. She is former uh, chair of the Stockholm uh, Football Association. I must confess that this is also my ambition for Italy, so I hope I have uh, the same uh, destiny you have. So please, Hilva, come here with us. Hi. And a second uh, amazing woman, uh, Minister of, uh, Slovi in, of Slovenia government. Uh, she's Minister of um, a very, very large portfolio. Uh, family, social affairs, labor workforce, and equal opportunities. Uh, Anja Kopac rank. Uh, she also is a very passionate woman, uh, and I want to suggest you to check uh, in her Facebook profile. You can find uh, very, very amazing, uh, beautiful pictures which testify her passion to travel to beautiful natural places. Uh, and uh, so I think that environment also is uh, a topic which is uh, in your heart. Anya, please come with us also. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Well, last but not least, our host, our kind host, Minister Yevgeny, is it right pronunciation? Osinowski, uh, yes, is the Estonian Minister of Health and uh, Employment. Um, yes, uh, I think I can summarize uh, his. Uh, mission, uh, both at political, cultural and social level, in, with one word, which is innovation, is uh, uh, trying to improve and modernize uh, smart countries. Well, you have already a smart country, but I think you have a so impressive curriculum uh, starting from uh, uh, your first experience uh, as a blue-collar worker, if I read well your biography, and uh, in the same time as a student of philosophy, you said philosophy can make person better as a, a, a professor of general linguistics. Uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, I think that uh, you also have a very hard job too. What is uh, uh, better 
to deal with education or health, you will say something about it maybe later. Please, uh, Yegveni, come with us. And I think on behalf of everybody here, thanks a lot for the excellent organization of this, uh, uh, of this conference. So, let me try to immediately focus on our issue because uh, we have not so, so much time and uh, you have a, an excellent stuff about it. They are very, very strict so, and anxious, so I ha we have to respect our timetable. Uh, you know, the title is How Do States Adapt uh, to Changes in Working Life? Or they, do they simply adapt or uh, are they uh, front runners in the process? Uh, before um, we kick off the debate, why uh, this topic is becoming more and more uh, relevant in the international and European discussion. My answer, just as a first provocation, is that we really have an elephant in the room. It is one you can see, you can see here in the slide. Uh, this is the very famous uh, Milanovic uh, uh, elephant cube, and uh, it shows, uh, uh, simply shows uh, uh, the income growth in the past 30 years all over the world. Uh, you have the poorest on the left and the richest on the right. Uh, the blue columns uh, are the worst poorest uh, as they come out from extreme poverty. And uh, the yellow color is uh, for uh, uh, developing world middle class, which is increasing uh, his status and his conditions. Uh, the top, of course, the top is marked in red as for the small percentage of uh, richest persons, people in the world. And they are still there, of course. Are there uh, some losers in this uh, figure? I think they are, unfortunately, and the losers uh, are our people in Western countries, in uh, European countries, also the middle class, uh, uh, which is in that part of the, the lowest, where uh, conditions uh, didn't increase so well in the last, uh, uh, the last decades. So I think uh, as members of uh, uh, important European countries, you have to, to, to a lot of work to do in order to, to put this elephant maybe in the right position. I would like to start from you, Ilva. What do you think about it? Uh, what, as a, you, as a policymaker, uh, do you think to have in your hands some uh, tools in order to, to, to make the situation of working condition, working life, innovation the best we can, also in our countries, in order to change this data for the next uh, uh, occasion we'll discuss about. Thank you. I'm going to uh, yes, uh, smile, uh, please. I think. Yes, I do think we have. And I think this, uh, this elephant also shows that it's uh, necessary for governments to take uh, initiatives uh, for uh, inclusive growth, because just growth is not enough. We also need inclusive growth that will uh, also that everybody could benefit. And I think this is what we can see in many countries: uh, the, the need of uh, the making the globalization pay for everyone, so that everybody will also get something back. And I think we are responsible to do that. And we also take an initiative from Sweden uh, on the global level for a global deal. It's about this is what it's about: how we can we together with social partners also uh, take initiatives for for inclusive growth because I think that's necessary. Necessary. Uh, may, I, may I make two, two trends that I have spotted that I think might be interesting in this aspect? Yeah, take this out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first is I think that uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, we from Sweden, we had a perspective of actually supporting people to, to, to transmit from to transfer from one job to another. When one job is disappearing, then you have to transfer to another job, another profession. We used to say that we are not protecting jobs, we are protecting workers. That's why we have to help them to get a new job. Uh, this is still true, but what we can see today is that jobs are not disappearing, but they are changing. So I think uh, the challenge is that when the, the job is developing in a very fast pace. 
And the risk is that this pace is faster than your own development. So you will yeah. be left behind uh, on the platform while your own job is just uh, developing faster than you are. So I think this is the new challenge. How can we not only help people to transfer from the upskilling from one job to another, but upskilling at the same job? because the job is uh, transforming and, and developing. And I think this is also one of the part of why it's uh, difficult for new, new, uh, those who ent make your entrance to the labor market, because you, when you end, uh, make your exam from the educational system, then you have to jump on the train while it's moving. <laughs> so that will be a gap between the skills you have received from your training and then the uh, the competence that's actually needed in these developing jobs. So I think that we need to take this into account and also to change how we, or develop how we support uh, people and in the transformation, not only from one job to another, but also from the, to continue with my same job. This is my one uh, trend. Another trend I also say, it's uh, from our experience in Sweden, it's important also that we invest in uh, the development of, of new uh, branches, uh, new jobs, new uh, industries. For example, we uh, may take an initiative, I think that was 50 years ago, uh, that all young people, uh, all children, should be able to learn to play uh, an instrument. That was a huge uh, initiative for making a more equal society. 30 years later, we have a boom in uh, Swedish musicians, uh, Swedish uh, artists uh, being globally successful. Um, 30 years ago, they had an initiative, oh, 25 years ago, uh, we had an initiative for all workers, all employees to have a uh, PC at home. So that shouldn't be a new uh, gap between those with good jobs uh, that could have a PC from their uh, employer and others that would be left behind. So we made a huge investment that all ordinary uh, families should have a home PC. What happened? They got their home PC. All children grow up playing with the PC, <laughs> uh, <laughs> making games, playing games. And now we have a boom in new uh, companies in the IT sector, like Spotify or Minecraft, and they are just being very, very globally successful. And we have a situation where uh, gaming industry is a bigger export than... Um, Iron ore, that used to be one of our biggest exports from my country. So I think that uh, governments really can make a difference. Great. Ilba, you talk about uh, a very important issue, in my opinion, which is uh, work and uh, is not disappearing, and some, somebody uh, these times try to explain, to, to um, testify work is uh, changing in nature, and this is a, a real condition we have to face. But you focus uh, um, namely on national policies. Uh, we are here in a very uh, important outstanding European contest uh, for this conference. Uh, Estonia has the Rotary Presidency of the Council of the European Union. So, Anya, I think that we have also to consider the contribution of the European Union uh, together with members, its member states uh, to this uh, need of uh, uh, adapting uh, its policy or better to become the European Union itself uh, a front runner in the global scenario. Do you think it's possible? Do you think, think do you see something right in the right direction or not? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Ilwa. I, I certainly agree with you that uh, the state intervention do matters. It's really important to see European countries with a different tradition and different trajectories, how different the outcomes are. But nevertheless, we are facing the same issues. Globalization, today we are talking about the changing nature of work, the forms of work. And we are all facing aging of our population and especially workforce, so we, we share common uh, issues. 
But nevertheless, we have different institutions to deal with it. We have different values. So still, we, we, have, we are talking about the European social model, which I think is really important for us that we should stick to it and find the solutions for our social model. If you compare the differences between us, are, they are also important. But if you compare European social model with different countries, for example, US or Japan, we are much more similar than that we are different to them. So it's really important that we um, do our work on our common European social model. So I think it's really important that we all together with trade unions and all the other stakeholders that we must be, we all must be on board on such issues that we uh, change our Bismarckian um, social security schemes. Because I think that new forms of work are always um, uh, existing in our, so we, the change, the work is always changing, the forms of work are always changing, so that's not something really new, the change is incorporated within the system. The only issue is, is how, we, um, how we adopt to those issues, and the fact is that social security schemes are difficult to adopt because of the tradition and the uh, interests which are uh, related to that issue. But nevertheless, I think that the key issue is how we will adopt our social security schemes, which are usually based on insurance-based schemes and safety nets to the new forms of work. So if you have self-employed people, it's an issue and a question how we will safeguard them uh, and put those kind of um, forms of work, the basic legal, economic and social security. So mm. we need to, to really reshape our social security scheme so that those people working on these forms uh, of work will have the same or similar social security within society. Because otherwise, we will face polarization. We are already facing uh, polarization. And that means that social cohesion, uh, we will face um, disturbances uh, within the EU and the negativity we see, uh, we are already facing those uh, negativities. So it's really important for our social model to adopt. And also it's important not to only adopt from this uh, point of view of um, benefit system, but also if we put, we speak of these changes, the di digitalization, automatization, the key issue is knowledge, the skills we are talking about, reskilling, upskilling. So this human capital, capital is coming uh, forefront and it's really important that we give all the people opportunity to to rescale, to be up to date regarding the skills which are required. So lifelong learning is really the yeah. key issue. So this uh, passive, we are talking now for many years that passive policies are not enough, but now it's really the time, it's really not efficient anymore. We need to uh, give people basic social security, of course, but we need to adapt uh, to uh, these systems to be um, more dynamic. So I think the, the need to, to find um, a common dominator within the EU countries, which are, we are different, similar, but different in many aspects, to find this uh, minimum level of consensus and proceed. So I think it's really important for the EU, for, for the functioning of the EU, that we agree upon the uh, social pillar, to have a really um, uh, in-depth discussion what that means, how inclusive growth, what we will um, satisfy for our citizens, that we will safeguard those uh, values which are really important. Thank you so much, Anya. You, uh, you touch very many relevant uh, different aspects we not ever talked about it this morning. Um, the education knowledge, of course, are key factors uh, also uh, talking about labor market change and conditions of work and uh, there will be a session uh, uh, after us uh, dedicated to this topic. Uh, but uh, another side of the coin, in my opinion, very, very important, uh, which is uh, in uh, governments at national and European level, 
uh, hands is welfare state, because welfare state is another very important feature of European identity, not simply in terms of values uh, and, uh, and the security conditions of uh, citizens, but also in terms of uh, uh, insurance uh, of our people uh, li all life long. Um, uh, Minister uh, uh, Yevegni, uh, you are in charge for health and uh, uh, employment, so I think you're the right person to, 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 to tell us something about it. But first of all, you must confess me, you are at home, you are among friends. It's uh, better to be a uh, Minister of Education or Health? What is the harder job? Tell us. Among friends and, <laughs> and to everybody look, watching <laughs> us online. Uh, uh, yes, um, no, I think the health portfolio is the most difficult portfolio of any government. So it's <laughs> it's, it's so. absolutely no, I trust uh, you. No, no question about it. Uh, people are never happy. Uh, in education, they... Mm, Sometimes are. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> yes. Sometimes it may happen. Well, uh, please. But, uh, but in general, of course, it's a... Um, I think uh, answer to your question depends a lot on, on, on how, how you view the, the actual uh, development or change that is occurring and what is your attitude towards that change. Of course, the change is quick, it's profound, uh, both on the economies but also on the societies. Uh, uh, but uh, there are various conclusions that one can draw from that. And, uh, and of course, one of the possible conclusions that has been drawn quite often in history is, is what I call rage against the machine. Uh, we know from the 19th century in, in Britain there were uh, uh, sewers who uh, smashed sewing machines because uh, the sewing machines were taking their jobs. Yeah. Uh, for them only to five years later to purchase one for themselves and find out that that's actually quite cool that you don't have to spend that much time to, to, do, the same, to, to, to do the same things. And of course uh, we see some of that happening also in the world uh, nowadays. But one has to understand why this is the case. And this, uh, here I go uh, back to what Ilva said, that we are not protecting the jobs, but we are protecting the people. Of course, if, if the disruption is so that, that people are, are, are left insecure, in poverty, uh, feeling disengaged, uh, to put it brutally useless, mm, in a yes. society, in an economy, of course, that creates a, a very strong negative reactions. In, in European current, or not European only, uh, but, but also European politics, uh, you see it uh, mostly realizing as a political risk, what I call poisoning of politics because of, 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 of growing inequalities and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think that this is the right answer to, to, to the challenge. Change, first, the change will happen anyway, so it's, it's, in a sense it's inevitable. You can, you can either move faster or you can try to slow it down, but the direction is still the same. Uh, and secondly, I don't think that there is uh, fundamentally any need for a, a doomsday pessimistic thinking on that. Uh, back again in the 19th century with, with steam engine being developed, we knew that, you know, uh, all those uh, nice, fantastic philosophical uh, works that, that were, were written at the time saying that, you know, people in 20 years will have loads of free time doing nothing, going to, to work for one day yeah. a, a week and then the rest of the time they will spend with their family and friends. Well, we know that this, is, this has not happened. Uh, in the past, you know, two decades we have seen the intensification of, of work actually uh, happening. So instead of jobs lost, you will get uh, new ones. And I have absolutely no doubt that this is uh, going to happen this time, or is happening. So it's not future of work. It's just, you know, it's it's a, a sort of term that 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 brings misconceptions that it is something that will happen in the future. Uh, this this change is occurring now and has been occurring for some time. It's it's just uh, ever with ever growing speed, but but it is something that we already know and understand. And uh, and therefore the mm, on the optimistic. Uh, in an optimistic way of thinking, which is my way of thinking, is that we, we should look for ways of adequately uh, being prepared for the change and at the same time doing two things. Firstly, uh, fast-forwarding innovation, so investing into uh, moving forward, moving, moving forward more quickly, 
which in a sense means actually investing also into job loss. Investing into innovation means also investing in job loss. But at the same time, uh, taking care of the, of the social uh, protection necessities that are on the background and are uh, absolutely vital. And here I think that Europe is, is the continent most fitted to, to that change that is occurring, precisely because we have a welfare state that is providing the most adequate level of social protection in the world. And it is our strength that we can be much more confident in that change than many other uh, uh, countries and regions of the world where we see these disparities and, and adequacy of social protection uh, much more at risk. So to conclude, uh, uh, not only do I think that, that welfare state will survive this change, I think that it in fact has to be strengthened. Of course, that doesn't mean just putting extra money in that, in that it has to become much more innovative and, and so on. But I think that, that the, uh, fundamentally there is a need for more and better and uh, adequate protection than before. Thank you so much. Uh, you raised uh, so many issues. Uh, I think that we'll find uh, very many questions, comments from the audience if we want to check something about it. Well, the first one. What are the changes that policymakers could be happy about? And at the same time, what makes you worry most? Um, Maybe it's another question for you. <laughs> I think that, that uh, year by year we all are doing uh, 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 jobs or work that is much more meaningful, humane in a sense. Uh, we, we are shedding jobs in, in many of the sectors that were or still are either dangerous or so routine that I think are not really fitted to, to, to humans. Uh, so it's, it's positive in this regard, and, and, and negatively, of course, it's, it's, it's the growing inequalities that are happening for a variety of reasons to which we haven't been able to fully uh, respond. Thank you so much. There is another one, maybe. Well, adaptation is already accepting that you are fairly late in global competition. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe it's right over here. <laughs> What is a front-running idea for New Europe, Sweden, Slovenia, Estonia? Maybe, Elba, you can try to give an answer to this Yes, question. I think uh, that's, that's correct. Adaptation is already in that effort. I think that that's correct, because you think, I think we have to um, be more uh, proactive and also being very positive towards the changes that are coming. Uh, when we talk about with the local uh, union leaders, for example, uh, and they were asked by uh, media, are you afraid of a new technology? And uh, they answered, no, I'm afraid of old technology. <laughs> and I think this is, this is the correct approach, uh, because new technology and new uh, um, ways of, of also organizing things could be uh, great opportunities. So we have to have that attitude. But may I say, there's of course a lot of things to say about forward running ideas, but let me put something according also to the, the previous question about what's worrying me. What worries me most is that uh, I have the impression that a lot of people, big groups of people, are losing faith in uh, the future, mm -hmm. are losing faith in the ability to uh, be able to change things that are not not good, be the ability to actually be part of society and part of progress in society. And, and that's why we can see so many threatening uh, protectionism, nationalism, racism, xenophobic. And I think this is really, really dangerous because if uh, that will be the case, then we will lose the, a lot of opportunities to actually gain from globalization and new technology and, and, and progress. And this is also, of course, a, a great responsibility for, for governments and for Europe and European Union to tackle this. And I think we can't do it just by words. We have to do it by actually involving people so that they could see by themselves, I am benefiting from the globalization, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I am part of something that it's going progress. I am part of society. There is something I can wish for and hope for. There is, there is of course, there's no quick fix, but the, the, I think this is one of the most crucial things, the attitude towards the future. Are we, are we 
positive or do we see that it might be positive if we do that and that and that? Or are we afraid? Because I think that's really what's threatening uh, a big part of the Western society today, and especially Europe. I think as politicians, thank you so much, uh, Hilda, we must uh, learn to be uh, to, to change the narrative and try to explain better which should be the cost uh, of no globalization and which should be the cost of uh, not cohesion in the European Union and something like this because it's not easy to explain to uh, citizens that uh, you're right. That's my opinion. Well, uh, maybe we have a very, very short time for the last uh, question of this session. In some member states, social partners have an important role in transition support. Is there a space for more social partner activity? How can that connect with that governments and the EU does? Europe, your, your destiny today. Uh. Yeah, we already had uh, <laughs> yes. today the discussion about the rule of trade unions. I, I think that the social dialogue uh, and, and the importance of the trade unions and the representatives of the employers is really crucial for making these changes that we need to make as uh, smoothly as possible. So I think that the social dialogue and uh, social partners are a key issue for on the national level as well on the uh, EU levels, and they as the states and the governments are facing problems and there are different attitudes and uh, the mistrust towards the people. I think it's the, the common attitude that mm, people are less and less uh, trusted in politics. Uh, so we all have uh, some problems to, to gain trust again. And the same is uh, with changes within the trade unions, uh, their structure, how to really address the needs of new workers, uh, the workers who work on these uh, less secured forms of work, and also the employers' organizations. So we all need, and there are huge differences if you look at um, the um, uh, states um, within the EU. In Slovenia, uh, because of the, our legacy, the, the rule of trade unions is uh, compared to the average in EU um, higher, but if you compare to the Nordic countries, the, um, the Swedes, uh, the, the level of uh, representatives of trade unions, we are lagging behind. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. on average, uh, the trade unions are important partners and we uh, introduce them in all um, in all important uh, decisions in Slovenia, it's really consensual society where trade unions have a lot, uh, have a huge uh, uh, impact on the decisions made on the national level. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, another topic uh, we, nobody mentioned today, I think. And uh, it's uh, another issue, there is a, a broad discussion, debate, uh, not only in my country, but at European at uh, international level. The universal basic income uh, as one of the two governments had in your hands in order to, 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 to make the situation better and everything you know. Well, uh, uh, Minister uh, Yevgeny, what is your opinion about it? Angela Merkel has said the very very precise words against that uh, solution some days ago. What do you think about it? Uh, in general, regarding uh, sort of passive uh, money transfers, I think that, that <coughs> we, we have to be quite frank with it. With, with current social trends, we, we, ain't, we aren't able in Europe to, to move uh, in the direction of, of just constantly increasing them. Uh, the pressures for, for even uh, guaranteeing social service on the same level are, are constantly increasing with, with the aging of population. Uh, that's one thing. But second is this exact uh, change we, we, uh, that, that is happening in societies and in our individual lives that uh, we are used to, uh, to, to dividing the uh, life of a person into, into very sharp and separate periods. That mm -hmm. we, you know, as a child, you're in formal education, mm -hmm. then you get your formal education, then you're out of it, that's it. You know, education ministry is not interested in you anymore. <laughs> now you go somewhere else. Uh, and after that, you're on the labor market, there you work, and uh, after a certain age, then you go into social system, and then you're paid until the end of your life. Uh, um, enough or not depends on, on the possibilities, but, but, but I think that this whole concept actually is, is evolving and should evolve much more quickly. 
Firstly, if we look at the, necess at the, at the pace of, of change, we know that uh, the understanding of, of, of these uh, skills and education as such has to change. Instead of saying that there is you know, formal education uh, obligation of whatever, uh, basic education or general education or whatever, we should uh, you know, really move in our mentality towards a lifelong uh, learning, I wouldn't say obligation, but, but, but more or less that we all have to understand uh, that we will have to not only change employers within the field, but the fields themselves will change many times during our working, working life. And that, of course, uh, uh, is, is the first thing. And second is, is, is about retirement. I think that this, uh, some of the countries like Sweden, we were just, just <laughs> discussing earlier, have, have made the change a long, long time ago. Estonia is planning to do that, that we, we will have much more you know, phasing in, phasing out of, uh, of activity, labor activity, being able to work and motivated to work uh, uh, as long as you're able mm -hmm. to do that, regardless of how old you are, really. So, so what does retirement age mean at all in, in, in this sense? Now, coming to, to basic income, uh, um, I, I uh, sort of uh, withhold a, a categorical judgment of that myself. Uh, it, I think there's much more work has to be done on the academic level uh, uh, about it. Uh, uh, just two remarks. Firstly, uh, we must be clear what are we trying to achieve. Uh, in some of the discussions in some countries, we're saying that this is a way of simplification of current social uh, redistribution schemes, that it's cheaper to just pay than administer all the, all the other issues. In Estonia, that's, that's not an argument. So with an e-state solutions, we basically administer all our social contribution and payments for zero euros. So, so for us, it's, it's not a cost efficiency issue at all. Uh, uh, and second, uh, of course, is a question of, of whether we are, uh, by that uh, uh, possibility, actually uh, motivating inactivity. And if that is the case, I think it's wrong, but of course there are discussions ongoing whether that's the case or mm -hmm. not, and it's good that some of the regions and, 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 and countries in the regions, or regions in the countries are, are piloting it, and, and I'm very eager to see what will be the results. Maybe, Hilva, you want to uh, Yeah, I, I just wanted to make yes. a comment. I totally agree with you, Javgeni, and I just to give you one example of this. Uh, Sweden have received a lot of refugees. We have a long tradition of that, but in 2015, we received more refugees than any OECD country ever has uh, done, uh, according to the population. So that's really uh, one big challenge that we are right into. And we have a discussion, uh, because one third of the refugees uh, roughly, have a low level of uh, education, a low level of skills. And we have a discussion, should the Swedish labor market adapt to the newcomers with low skills, changing the labor market with more low-paid, low-skilled jobs, or should the newcomers adapt to the Swedish labor market? There are two different ways of, of uh, doing this. And we said, well, they should adapt to the Swedish labor market. That's why we are now introducing, uh, it's, it's compulsory mm. to go into education if you have a low level of educational skills when, if, when you're a newcomer. That's uh, um, a prerequisite for getting your benefit. You have to go into yeah. education. So there will be at least two years of basic education, not only in Swedish, but also reading and writing and math and social science yeah. and so on, because we, we think this is necessary for people to be able to enter the Swedish labor market. So that's not passive how we can use the active, but sometimes, of course, with incentives, but also sometimes with making it compulsory. It's a very interesting experience, the Swedish one. I read something about it, and uh, you know that immigrants' uh, integration uh, in the labor market and in, the, in generally speaking, society is uh, a relevant issue for Europe and for my country more than others. So I, I totally agree with you that we have to focus uh, on some very, uh, very precise special policies about it. You want to interact with yeah, this? I just wanted to add that in Slovenia we have quite um, 
intense discussion about yeah. the basic income. The, the ah, issue, yes, the previous one. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. The right. basic income, because the problem is if you're not covering with social security schemes the new forms of work, then you have more and more people outside and there is a growing need for them. And uh, my opinion, if we won't change our social security, traditional social security scheme, there will be the pressure to introduce some kind of universality uh, even uh, bigger. And the, the key issue is that we, with the introduction of uh, basic income, then we um, put under the question or we mismatch with the world of work with the social security, which was part of the tradition within the European social uh, model, Bismarckian uh, roots and so on. But it has uh, positive sides on active citizenship and so on. So a lot of acad academic research are going on. So we are still looking how, but uh, it is a um, new approach to it. And we cannot say what, what the, the results would certainly be. Yes, uh, Anya, you have the floor. Uh, I, I want to, to, to hear from your experience because uh, uh, in your very large portfolio, you also have equal opportunities. Uh, uh, what do you think about gender policies uh, in this uh, so fast changing uh, uh, world of work? Uh, we didn't mention anything uh, today about this topic. Uh, do you mm. think that uh, we are able to introduce uh, uh, both at national and European level some uh, policies uh, which uh, can try women uh, not to stay apart? This is a risk they have. Mm. This is a more flexible, more uh, innovative uh, uh, environment of working, uh, or uh, or not? <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the situation of women on the Slovene labor market is quite positive because usually in Slovenia women tend to work full time. So we only 13.7% women are part time, but those who are working are mainly subsidized by the state because they have children under three or if they have two under seven and we are subsidizing them the uh, difference between working part time and full time regarding social contribution. So this this package of uh, policies regarding gender equality on the labor market is really working out in Slovenia. We, we are the country with the, the lowest pay gap, only 8% uh, is the uh, pay gap uh, in Slovenia and more than 60% of women are full-time employed. But uh, that is due to the fact that women don't interrupt their careers due to uh, giving birth or having small children because of the whole package of measures. For example, we have uh, quite accessible and affordable kindergartens. And for example, in schools, um, they, we offer um, uh, free meals, uh, hot meals, mm. uh, so they, they are, the, the parents can work uh, in the afternoons, there is no need for them to be really soon at mm. home, so to work part-time for women. Then we have really good parental, uh, parental leave arrangement with offering 100% uh, uh, um, uh, this um, uh, pay leave for one year and also for fathers, so it's really a mixture of different uh, measures. So at the end, women are working uh, full-time, but nevertheless, the change within the family lives and division between families is still that we are saying that women are double, double burdened because they still perform uh, a lot of home domestic work. So we are now trying with our policies to make better balance between family and family obligations between yes. the, the sex. So, uh, but our um, experience is that really politics do matter regarding those issues. And I, if uh, just a sentence about the EU politics regarding gender, I think if you compare what was the impact of different policies on national policies, I think that the issue of gender mainstreaming uh, make a difference um, the, on the EU level and how it was transformed on the national levels. First, talking about women on the labor market, but um, broadening the perspective on this uh, family issue. So. Uh, moving from this public also to the uh, private sphere. So I, I think that that was a good uh, job done by the EU. 
Yeah, I can imagine. I think that politics matter together with the cultural change, mm. some, especially in some areas and uh, regions of Europe. Well, we have time for a couple, maybe a, a new questions. So if you choose something interesting for us. Oh, a long one. How do you see the role of government in funding technology research? Digitalization doesn't come from nowhere. Yeah, you're right. It's the product of investment, basic research, in my opinion, the result. What can government do on the front end of change rather than adapting to the back end? I think it's for you. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, of course, it's as I said in the beginning, that I think the, the governments should step up uh, investments in innovation. And we know that uh, in Europe, those countries who, who invest more are more successful across the board. So it's not just uh, the, the, the you know, very narrow industries or, or academia that is winning from it, but the whole society is benefiting. So, And we know that a lot of uh, actual uh, applicable uh, technology has come from, uh, started from academia, has mm. started from basic research, as, you, as yeah. you mentioned, and started from universities. So, so this is clearly the, the, the most, most important. And second is, of course, uh, uh, supporting uh, and helping uh, the technological uh, sort of ecosystem uh, uh, to flourish. That also means, apart from universities, not just investment, but the ecosystem. And in Estonia, as you know, we've, we've done that uh, very strongly and, and, and actively in terms of, of, uh, of IT sector, in terms of supporting our startups, the, the community here. That means investing in education, international schools, uh, in, in many other different spheres that are necessary in order to actually attract talent to, to keep this uh, e ecosystem in general running. So it's not only money, but it also, it's also a matter of mm. attention to, to those who are, yes. are developing it. And last word, Ilva, you started, or maybe you concluded? Yes, I think, yeah. of course, we need to invest in research, but. I at least our experience is that's not really uh, the weak sector. The weak sector is the implementation. Mm -hmm. How can we help small and medium-sized enterprises to really use the new technology so that they can keep up the pace with the development? This is where, where we make investments right now. Uh, of course, we need to continue investment in research, but that, that's not enough. I think the implementations in society and especially in small and medium-sized companies, it's uh, crucial. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to, to all of you. It's the best conclusion, uh, in my opinion. Try to invest much more in research, education, because uh, this <laughs> is the key factor, <laughs> uh, after all, uh, which can be uh, the, the, the real uh, uh, turning point for our countries. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here. We are on time. Oh, yes, this is the right elephant. I yeah. hope uh, <laughs> we can uh, discuss about uh, next time uh, in a similar contest. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.